Chapter 14. There is no Eastern solution. The crisis of organized religion in the West and the numberless ways in which religious morality has actually managed to fall well below the human average has always led some anxious seekers to pursue a softer solution east of Suez. Indeed, I once joined these potential adepts and acolytes, donning orange garb and attending the ashram of a celebrated guru in Pune in the lovely hills above Bombay. I adopted this sannyas mode in order to help make a documentary film for the BBC, so you may well question my objectivity if you wish. But the BBC at that time did have a standard of fairness, and my mandate was to absorb as much as I could. One of these days, having in the course of my life been an Anglican, educated at a Methodist school, converted by marriage to Greek Orthodoxy, recognized as an incarnation by the followers of Sai Baba, and remarried by a rabbi, I shall be able to try and update William James's Varieties of Religious Experience. The guru in question was named Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. Bhagwan simply means God or Godly, and Sri means Holy. He was a man with huge soulful eyes and a bewitching smile, and a natural if somewhat dirty sense of humor. His sibilant voice, usually deployed through a low-volume microphone at early morning darshan, possessed a faintly hypnotic quality. This was of some use in alleviating the equally hypnotic platitudinousness of his discourses. Perhaps you have read Anthony Pohl's tremendous twelve-volume novel sequence, A Dance to the Music of Time. In it, a mysterious seer named Dr. Trelawney keeps his group of enlightened followers together in spite of various inevitable difficulties. These initiates can recognize each other not by the individuality of their garb, but by an exchange of vowels. On meeting, the first must intone, the essence of the all is the godhead of the true. The proper response to this is, the vision of visions heals the blindness of sight. Thus is the spiritual handshake affected. I heard nothing at the Bhagwan's knee, one had to sit cross-legged, that was any more profound than that. There was more emphasis on love in its eternal sense than in Dr. Trelawney's circle, and certainly there was more emphasis on sex in its immediate sense, but on the whole, the instruction was innocuous. Or it would have been, if not for a sign at the entrance to the Bhagwan's preaching tent. This little sign never failed to irritate me. It read, Shoes and minds must be left at the gate. There was a pile of shoes and saddles next to it, and in my transcendent condition I could almost picture a heap of abandoned and empty mentalities to round out this literally mindless little motto. I even attempted a brief parody of a Zen koan. What is the reflection of a mind discarded? For the blissed-out visitor or tourist, the ashram presented the outward aspect of a fine spiritual resort, where one could burble about the beyond in an exotic and luxurious setting. But within its holy precincts, as I soon discovered, there was a more sinister principle at work. Many damaged and distraught personalities came to Pune, seeking advice and counsel. Several of them were well off. The clients or pilgrims included a distant member of the British royal family, and were at first urged, as with so many faiths, to part with all their material possessions. Proof of the efficacy of this advice could be seen in the fleet of Rolls-Royce motorcars maintained by the Bhagwan, and deemed to be the largest such collection in the world. After this relatively brisk fleecing, initiates were transferred into group sessions where the really nasty business began. Wolfgang Dobrovolny's film, Ashram, shot in secret by a former devotee and adapted for my documentary, shows the playful term Kundalini in a fresh light. In a representative scene, a young woman is stripped naked and surrounded by men who bark at her, drawing attention to all her physical and psychic shortcomings, until she's abject with tears and apologies. At this point, she is hugged and embraced and comforted and told that she now has a family. Sobbing with masochistic relief, she humbly enters the tribe. It was not absolutely clear what she had to do in order to be given her clothes back, but I did hear some believable and ugly testimony on this point. In other sessions involving men, things were rough enough for bones to be broken and lives lost. The German princeling of the House of Windsor was never seen again, and his body was briskly cremated without the tedium of an autopsy. I had been told in respectful and awed tones that the Bhagwan's body has some allergies, and not long after my sojourn he fled the ashram and then apparently decided that he had no further use for his earthly frame. What happened to the Rolls-Royce collection I never found out but his acolytes received some kind of message to reconvene in the small town of Antelope, Oregon, in the early months of 1983, and this they did, though now less committed to the Pacific and laid-back style. The local inhabitants were disconcerted to find an armed compound being erected in their neighborhood, with unsmiling orange guard security forces. An attempt to create space for the new ashram was apparently made. In a bizarre episode, food poisoning matter was found to have been spread over the produce in an Antelope supermarket. Eventually, the commune broke up, and dispersed amid serial recriminations, and I have occasionally run into empty-eyed, 
refugees from the Bhagwan's long and misleading tuition. He himself has been reincarnated as Osho, in whose honour a glossy but stupid magazine was being produced until a few years ago. Possibly a remnant of his following still survives. I would say that the people of Antelope, Oregon, miss being as famous as Jonestown by a fairly narrow margin. El sueño de la razón produce monstruos. The sleep of reason, it has been well said, brings forth monsters. The immortal Francisco Goya gave us an etching with this title in his series Los Caprichos, where a man in defenseless slumber is hag-ridden by bats, owls, and other haunters of the darkness. But an extraordinary number of people appear to believe that the mind and the reasoning faculty, the only thing that divides us from our animal relatives, is something to be distrusted and even as far as possible dulled. The search for nirvana and the dissolution of the intellect goes on, and whenever it is tried it produces a Kool-Aid effect in the real world. Make me one with everything. So goes the Buddhist's humble request to the hot dog vendor. But when the Buddhist hands over a $20 bill to the vendor, in return for his slathered bun, he waits a long time for his change. Finally asking for it, he is informed that change comes only from within. All such rhetoric is almost too easy to parody, as is that of missionary Christianity. In the old Anglican cathedral in Calcutta, I once paid a visit to the statue of Bishop Reginald Heber, who filled the hymn books of the Church of England with verses like these. What though the tropic breezes blow soft o'er Ceylon's isle, where every prospect pleases and only man is vile, what though with loving kindness the gifts of God are strown, the heathen in his blindness bows down to wood and stone. It is partly in reaction to the condescension of old colonial boobies like this that many Westerners have come to revere the apparently more seductive religions of the Orient. Indeed, Sri Lanka, the modern name for the lovely island of Ceylon, is a place of great charm. Its people are remarkable for their kindness and generosity. How dare Bishop Heber have depicted them as vile? However, Sri Lanka is a country now almost utterly ruined and disfigured by violence and repression, and the contending forces are mainly Buddhist and Hindu. The problem begins with the very name of the state. Lanka is the old Sinhalese language name for the island, and the prefix Sri simply means holy, in the Buddhist sense of the word. This post-colonial renaming meant that the Tamils, who are chiefly Hindu, felt excluded at once. They prefer to call their homeland Elam. It did not take long for this ethnic tribalism, reinforced by religion, to wreck the society. Though I personally think that the Tamil population had a reasonable grievance against the central government, it is not possible to forgive their guerrilla leadership for pioneering long before Hezbollah and Al-Qaeda, the disgusting tactic of suicide murder. This barbarous technique, which was also used by them to assassinate an elected president of India, does not excuse the Buddhist-led pogroms against Tamils or the murder by a Buddhist priest of the first elected president of independent Sri Lanka. Conceivably, some readers of these pages will be shocked to learn of the existence of Hindu and Buddhist murderers and sadists. Perhaps they dimly imagine that contemplative Easterners devoted to vegetarian diets and meditative routines are immune to such temptations. It can even be argued that Buddhism is not, in our sense of the word, a religion at all. Nonetheless, the perfect one is alleged to have left one of his teeth behind in Sri Lanka, and I once attended a ceremony which involved a rare public showing by priests of this gold-encased object. Bishop Heber did not mention bone in his stupid hymn, though it would have made just as good a rhyme as stone, and perhaps this was because Christians have always foregathered to bow down to bones of supposed saints and to keep them in grisly reliquaries in their churches and cathedrals. However, that may be, at the truth propitiation, I had no feeling at all of peace and inner bliss. To the contrary, I realized that if I was a Tamil, I would have a very good chance of being dismembered. The human species is an animal species without very much variation within it, and it's idle and futile to imagine that a voyage to Tibet, say, will discover an entirely different harmony with nature or eternity. The Dalai Lama, for example, is entirely and easily recognizable to a secularist. In exactly the same way as a medieval princeling, he makes the claim not just that Tibet should be independent of Chinese hegemony, a perfectly good demand, if I may render it into everyday English, but that he himself is a hereditary king appointed by heaven itself. How convenient! Dissenting sects within his faith are persecuted. His one-man rule in an Indian enclave is absolute. He makes absurd pronouncements about sex and diet, and when on his trips to Hollywood fundraisers, anoints major donors like Stephen Seagal and Richard Gere as holy. Indeed, even Mr. Gear was moved to whine a bit when Mr. Seagal was invested as a tulku, or person of high enlightenment. It must be annoying to be outbid at such a spiritual auction. I will admit that the current Dalai, or Supreme Lama, is a man of some charm and presence, as I will admit that the present Queen of England is a person of more integrity than most of her predecessors. But this does not invalidate the critique of hereditary monarchy, and the first foreign visitors to Tibet were downright appalled 
and the feudal domination and hideous punishments that kept the population in permanent serfdom to a parasitic monastic elite. How might one easily prove that Eastern faith was identical with the unverifiable assumptions of Western religion? Here is a decided statement by Gudo, a very celebrated Japanese Buddhist of the first part of the 20th century. As a propagator of Buddhism, I teach that all sentient beings have the Buddha nature, and that within the Dharma there is equality with neither superior nor inferior. Furthermore, I teach that all sentient beings are my children. Having taken these golden words as the basis of my faith, I discovered that they are in complete agreement with the principles of socialism. It was thus that I became a believer in socialism. There you have it again. A baseless assumption that some undefined external force has a mind of its own, and the faint but menacing suggestion that anyone who disagrees is in some fashion opposed to the holy or paternal will. I excerpt this passage from Brian Victoria's exemplary book, The Zen at War, which describes the way the majority of Japanese Buddhists decided that Gudo was right in general, but wrong in particular. People were indeed to be considered children, as they are by all faiths, but it was actually fascism and not socialism that the Buddha and the Dharma required of them. Mr. Victoria is a Buddhist adept and claims, I leave this to him, to be a priest as well. He certainly takes his faith seriously and knows a great deal about Japan and the Japanese. His study of the question shows that Japanese Buddhism became a loyal servant, even an advocate, of imperialism and mass murder, and that it did so not so much because it was Japanese, but because it was Buddhist. In 1938, leading members of the Nichiren sect founded a group devoted to Imperial Way Buddhism. It declared as follows. Imperial Way Buddhism utilizes the exquisite truth of the Lotus Sutra to reveal the majestic essence of the national polity. Exalting the true spirit of Mahayana Buddhism is a teaching which reverently supports the emperor's work. This is what the great founder of our sect, St. Nichiren, meant when he referred to the divine unity of sovereign and Buddha. For this reason, the principal image of adoration in Imperial Way Buddhism is not Buddha Shakyamuni, who appeared in India, but His Majesty the Emperor, whose lineage extends over 10,000 generations. Effusions like this are, however wicked they may be, almost beyond criticism. They consist, like most professions of faith, in merely assuming what has to be proved. Thus, a bald assertion is then followed with the words, for this reason, as if all the logical work had been done by making the assertion. All of the statements of the Dalai Lama, who happens not to advocate imperialist slaughter, but who did loudly welcome the Indian government's nuclear tests, are also of this non-sequitur type. Scientists have an expression for hypotheses that are utterly useless even for learning from mistakes. They refer to them as being not even wrong. Most so-called spiritual discourse is of this type. You will notice further that in the view of this school of Buddhism, there are other schools of Buddhism, every bit as contemplative, that are in error. This is just what an anthropologist of religion would expect to find of something that was, having been manufactured, doomed to be schismatic. But on what basis could a devotee of Buddha Shakyamuni argue that his Japanese co-thinkers were in error themselves. Certainly not by using reasoning or evidence, which are quite alien to those who talk of the exquisite truth of the Lotus Sutra. Things went from bad to worse once Japanese generals had mobilized their Zen-obedient zombies into complete obedience. The mainland of China became a killing field, and all the major sects of Japanese Buddhism united to issue the following proclamation. Revering the imperial policy of preserving the Orient, the subjects of Imperial Japan bear the humanitarian destiny of one billion people of color. We believe it is time to effect a major change in the course of human history, which has been centered on Caucasians. This echoes the line taken by the Shinto, another quasar religion enjoying state support, that Japanese soldiers really fell for the cause of Asian independence. Every year there is a famous controversy about whether Japan's civil and spiritual leaders should visit the Yakasuni Shrine, which officially ennobles Hirohito's army. Every year, Millions of Chinese and Koreans and Burmese protest that Japan was not the enemy of imperialism in the Orient, but a newer and more vicious form of it, and that the Yakasuni Shrine is a place of horror. How interesting, however, to note that Japanese Buddhists of the time regarded their country's membership of the Nazi fascist axis as a manifestation of liberation theology, or, as the United Buddhist leadership phrased it at the time, in order to establish eternal peace in East Asia, arousing the great benevolence and compassion of Buddhism, we are sometimes accepting and sometimes forceful. We now have no choice but to exercise the benevolent forcefulness of killing one in order that many may live. Isatsu Tasho. This is something which Mahayana Buddhism approves of, only with the greatest of seriousness. No holy war or crusade advocate could have put it better. 
The eternal peace bit is particularly excellent. By the end of the dreadful conflict that Japan had started, it was Buddhist and Shinto priests who were recruiting and training the suicide bombers, or kamikaze, divine wind, fanatics, assuring them that the emperor was a golden wheel-turning sacred king, one indeed of the four manifestations of the ideal Buddhist monarch, and a tathagata, or fully enlightened being, of the material world. And, since Zen treats life and death indifferently, why not abandon the cares of this world, and adopt a policy of prostration at the feet of a homicidal dictator? This grisly case also helps to undergird my general case for considering faith as a threat. It ought to be possible for me to pursue my studies and researches in one house, and for the Buddhist to spin his wheel in another. But contempt for the intellect has a strange way of not being passive. One of two things may happen. Those who are innocently credulous may become easy prey for those who are less scrupulous, and who seek to lead and inspire them. Or those whose credulity has led their own society into stagnation may seek a solution, not in true self-examination, but in blaming others for their backwardness. Both these things happened in the most consecratedly spiritual society of them all. Although many Buddhists now regret that deplorable attempt to prove their own superiority, no Buddhist since then has been able to demonstrate that Buddhism was wrong in its own terms. A faith that despises the mind of the free individual, that preaches submission and resignation, and that regards life as a poor and transient thing, is ill-equipped for self-criticism. Those who become bored by conventional Bible religions, and seek enlightenment by way of the dissolution of their own critical faculties into nirvana in any form, had better take a warning. They may think they are leaving the realm of despised materialism, but they are still being asked to put their reason to sleep, and to discard their minds along with their saddles.